join us September 25th, 26th, and 27th for a three-day special streaming event, Strange Realities, to push the limits of your reality. Featuring authors, academics, researchers, occultists, experiencers, podcasters, and practitioners. All presenting fresh cutting edge material and research. Streaming live. Featuring presentations by Brent Rain, editor of Alternate Perceptions Magazine. Aaron Golias, host of the Saucer Life Podcast. David Metcalf, writer and researcher. Alan Greenfield, author of Secret Cipher of the Euphonox. Stephanie Quick, writer and blogger. Red Pill Junkie, 14 researcher and explorer. Tim Banal, host of Banal of America. Guy Malone, iconoclast and troublemaker. Timothy Ritter, host of Strange Familiars. Kiki Dombrowski, author and practitioner. Greg Bishop, author of Project Beta. Jenny Ashford, host of 13 O'Clock. Recluse, host of The Farm. Jack Montgomery, folk magic. Joshua Cutchin, author of Thieves in the Night. Reverend Michael Carter, alien contact experiencer. Dr. Future, host of Future Quick. Tony Kale, author of Memphis Hoodoo. Rin Collier, occultist. Soraya Ascap, host of Where Did the Road Go? And John Tinney, Ghost Stalkers in Hell. All three days, only $20. Tickets and info available at strangerealitiesconference.com. Brought to you by the Conspiranormal Podcast. Conspiranormal.com. Strange realities. Welcome back to Conspiranormal, everybody. And it is your humble, gracious host, Adam. And uh, oh, we are counting down. Yes, we are. Strange Realities Conference. Yes, Stream we are. Live. Tickets available at strangerelitiesconference.com. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, guys, we, uh, we're excited tonight because we've got some people that uh, we're fans of and that are apparently fans of ours that we've kind of circled around for a little while. And these are the guys from the Liminal Earth website and project. We got Garrett and Jeremy with us here. And guys, welcome to Conspiracy Normal. Hello. Hey, hey. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah thank you for thank you for coming on, guys. Um, you know, like we were talking about in our little pre-show introduction that nobody hears. We were talking about how, you know, we've had a couple of you guys ambassadors on. We had AP Strange on back in February, and a couple of months later, we had um, Kiki Dombrowski, who's actually here in our local area, and is joining us. At the Strange Realities Conference, by the way. And um, I guess that's how we kind of came on you guys' radar. And, um, you know, I've been looking at the site a lot today. And it's pretty impressive, this thing that you guys have called Liminal Earth. So let's just go from there. You know, what kind of like, how did this project start for you guys? Yeah, sounds good. So, um, yeah, Garrett and I, um, we, we have been online sort of, friend online friends back since like the early days of blogging um there's a, a third member as well who uh is our mysterious um quebecan farmer <laughs> named tim. you'll hear you'll hear tim mentioned every now and again but uh he he's he's not a, a public face of the mass of the map so he's a uh, quebecan farmer is that what you said yeah. <laughs> yes that's correct <laughs> quebecan, i guess if you if you want to say it the way they do quebecan <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh the three of us have been just chatting online and we have we all have blogs like back in like 2003 2004 where we would talk about politics and weird stuff and you know sometimes the paranormal world and you know we would just write back and forth in each other's comment sections and link to each other and um so one day i i can't even remember when it was but garrett i noticed was was in Seattle, um, and I, that's where I am as well. And uh, and I was like, hey, you know, we should totally get together sometime. Actually, I can't remember. Garrett, was it me who said that to you, or you? Yeah, yeah, totally. He did. Oh, it was me. Okay. And Garrett was like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. Like, tell me your address. And um, so I gave him my address, and it ended up that we lived literally across the street from each other. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, How weird is that? Okay. It was, yeah. and you know, we've been living there for you know probably a year or so. Just never bumped into each other or anything like that out walking around. But what do you know? You know, we still talked a lot more online than we did, like, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. It's true. Okay. Yeah, but it all began with the synchro. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and then we've just been, you know, we, we talk back and forth. We send emails and, you know, we have this sort of Slack channel where we've been talking for a while. And um, 
then we, go ahead no go ahead well we all um, one of the another thing we talked about a lot is like our dream life we would we would share that with each other and we started uh tracking our dreams and and anything weird that had happened to us in this database just to see if there was any trends or anything mm-hmm. um reoccurring and so we were kind of into this idea of like storing all this information about uh like data of our weird uh mystical and you know liminal life with each other and i think yeah yeah the map that we came up with was just another extension of that we're like Mm -hmm. what if we started putting these things that have happened to us like in seattle like on a map and uh and you kind of we were thinking i think in like a how do you pronounce it? like Tolkien or Tolkien kind of style, like Lord of the Rings of where the yeah, yeah. where's the Shire and where Mordor is obviously like where Amazon is, you know. <laughs> so we're kind of like thinking of like, and like where the mystical kind of like fairy worlds are and where our experiences were, and so we were just kind of mapping that. Um, and and yeah. and then I, and then I decided I think I was like, hey, I'm gonna put this on Facebook and just see if many of my friends had had weird experiences. You know, they don't want to add to this. And then it just, like, exploded. And we got, like, so many re- replies to it. Um, yeah, yeah. It just kind of took off from there. Yeah, and that back then we were Liminal Seattle. It was just going to be specifically for the Seattle area. Uh, but we, we then started uh, kind of getting into social media. Um, we're really active on Twitter in particular. And uh, we kind of fell in with, like, the uh, John Tenney world. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of that. John's a great dude. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that whole sort of online community, and then so as more and more people started getting into this liminal Seattle thing, other people started getting interested in doing it in their areas, and and we thought, well, let's just open this sucker up. So, um, <laughs> I, just so I don't I don't even remember when it was that we did it that we opened it up to everybody because time right now doesn't seem to exist. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we ended up opening up to the whole world, and um, you know we've had it's the bulk of our entries are still in the U.S. for you know probably obvious reasons, but um, we've had a lot of entries from a lot of other places. There's a lot in um, like the U.K. right now, and uh, we have a whole bunch of UFOs in Brazil, and um, yeah, and we still get lots of submissions. We just did this an update uh, yesterday. I finished updating the map with like 20 new entries from all around the world, so. Yeah, we just got one like half an hour before we came on here. You know, people are still sending us stuff. And we need we need more people to send us things. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I mean, we really rely on everyone to share their stories with us because it, um, it that's what we want is people's personal experiences. Mm-hmm. Is there a type of story that you guys get more than any other? I mean, have you have a way to kind of tally that? Like, do you get ghost experiences more do you get ufo experiences do you get cryptids like what would probably win out probably ghosts and ufos okay i would say i mean i think those are kind of more universal and they're also probably um something that like more people it's not just like a universal experience but like they're they're very cross-cultural kind of i think um and so I think that, you know, you can see, you can go, you can be anywhere in the world and see the UFO, or you can go into any building in the in the world and, and believe that you encounter the presence of a spirit. Um, but that might not be the case for, you know, cryptids or, you know, time slips or anything like that. I don't know. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Right. Before you guys uh, came together to do this, before you made each other, I know you said you were sharing information on dreams and stuff like that. Are there, what are the other more like uh, individual areas of your interests? Maybe things that you have in common, but then also things that you really concentrate on individually. I don't know if this is answering your question. I think a, a place that Jeremy and I and Tim meet up is the kind of uh, we're interested in the kind of whimsical side of it and not. Uh, not necessarily debunking things, kind of just uh, just sharing weird ideas and, and listening to people's uh, exp- experiences, even as far out as they sound. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, kind of like a common thread. We're not like ghost bros. That's a, this idea, yeah, yeah. you know, going in and like 
trying to uh, murder ghosts or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are, are yelling at them. Right, right. Yeah. That's not... I think that's what we have. We have a shared interest in that. And it, it's, yeah. um, I mean, we take it seriously. We take, you know, I'll listen, you know, what people have to say. And I, I you know, I, I don't want to cast doubt on anything that they're saying, unless they're like having a really tough time or something and trying to help them through it. But I think it's also, we just have fun with it. Like it's, it can be a yeah. fun thing and it can kind of like open your mind to like what the world is. Uh, it's what's possible in this world, you know, and n- even if it's wild, it's kind of it's just a fun way to live uh, life, I think. So, yeah, I think that's just one of the things that we maybe meet up on. Um, and uh, Jeremy has like a really in depth, I feel like deep, almost like encyclopedic uh, background and all this stuff. Where I, I and I don't really have that. I mostly just uh, live my life being scared about this stuff and then trying to get over it. But uh, he actually, I like research, you know, like deep research about stuff. So um, there's a little bit of difference there. Keeping like a an kind of agnostic attitude towards it, and just having having fun with the speculation. Right. Never really landing on on anything. But I think I'd also say, you know, each of us kind of brings our own. Like Garrett's um, <clears throat> Garrett's into like um, ham radio. <laughs> oh god and uh you know, <laughs> that side of things and um well but it's cool because like we so we'll do things we went to uh we were um tabling at an event out here um and uh it, it was there's the there's a local paranormal themed music label basically um <clears throat> and uh so they they've invited us to a couple of their music festivals just to table and you know show off what we're doing and, and be weird and uh garrett gable uh, PowerPoint presentation there on how you could potentially use ham radio to communicate with UFOs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that was like a really cool thing. Um, and then like I'm into plants. I'm into like I'm a plant guy. I do like foraging wild plants and you know I teach classes on it and stuff every now and again. Um, so I kind of try and bring that side of it into it. The whole idea of like a paranormal ecosystem and, and how we might approach this field the way that we do um, like botany or uh, biosystems just out there in nature, kind of. Um, so we definitely have our own sort of lanes that merge together during the project. Yeah, in, in that case, like, I guess you were talking about like kind of like biodiversity and then like the diversity of the phenomenon itself, kind of comparing the two. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Like, and, and it's all like, I mean, it's all, it's, it's, you know, a largely theoretical. I don't think any of us land on anything, but you know, if you go and look at like the life cycle of a jellyfish, have you ever looked at the life cycle of a jellyfish of a picture of it? No. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm serious. Like check it out. Just do a image search for the life cycle of a jellyfish. And at every stage of the jellyfish's life, it looks like something different, right? Right. Uh, and so I'm thinking, like, sorry, I just I feel like I lost somebody's background noise or something. I, sorry. Uh, so so I'm thinking, like, so what what if this phenomenon, you know, we see a UFO? What if that's just like one portion of a life stage of a creature that's also manifesting or an entity that's also manifesting in some other form or some other way um, to someone else in the phenomenon? It's like a life form thing, right? Yeah. Or, um, or like cicadas, like this idea that, you know, there are these creatures that live underground for every, you know, I forget what it is, like 17, 19 13 years. 13 or like 17, 13 and 17 years. 13 and 17, yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden they all come out at once. Um, and like to me, I'm like, well, UFO flaps, right? Like that's, yeah. you know, what, there, there's a parallel there. And I don't know exactly what that parallel is, but to me that like, that's a fascinating way to look at this. And I think the map kind of helps with that. It's interesting that you say that, especially about UFOs, um, because, I mean, that's one of the – an alternate theory for UFOs is that they're actually living biological life form. Mm -hmm. So that's an an interesting interesting kind of like thought process there or thought experiment. Well, let's talk about like you guys' own own personal experiences – just like kind of what was one thing that maybe happened to you guys whenever you were younger or whatever that kind of like set you on this path to be interested in all this? 
Yeah. Um, for me, I, well, growing up in Florida helped. <laughs> yeah that's a real that's that's a weird place in and is of itself right streets. yeah yeah so i lived there for you know the first you know 24 years of my life and um yeah it's it's just it's a strange place and i also lived in saint augustine which is the oldest um continually oh, yeah. european you know there's the famous saint augustine lighthouse and all that stuff oh yeah i've been there mm -hmm. yeah i always see those people and i'm like you know the lighthouse man you guys are missing out on the stuff that's really spooky in that town <laughs> you keep going to the light well, the, the, i think the fort is a weird place too right the old fort yes. there on the on the waterfront yeah exactly yeah yeah but there's some other places that are really creepy some places back in the woods and um you know, I was always kind of uh, a reader as a kid, and I kind of got into this. And then I had a um, sort of a somebody who was started off as a babysitter, uh, but ended up becoming a friend. It was this woman named um, Willie Watkins, and uh, she was basically she was like a um, <clears throat> like a new age psychic swamp witch. Mm -hmm. She was um, this this albino woman who lived with her husband in the middle of the the woods in the Florida swamp in a like with a Quonset hut workshop where they worked on old appliances. Okay. And uh, so she would always like we would go to her place. Um, she was a she was our babysitter as well. Um, she was family friends. And we would go to her place and we would just um, she would tell us stories about all this kind of stuff. She would be like, oh, yeah, there's a there's an angel and a ghost who live at the graveyard down the street. And I just saw him the other day and she would talk about this stuff like she was um, talking about, like, going grocery shopping or <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, planning yeah. a party for her daughter. Like, oh, by the way, just the other night we had Bigfoot walk by the, the back porch and. It was so, just for her, just another part of the world, you know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and so she was, she was just an amazing influence um, in my life all the way up until she passed uh, a few years ago. Um, but we kept in touch. Although she still sends messages to my wife on Facebook Messenger. Her Facebook is still interesting. Out. Yeah, and occasionally my wife will get like a hello or something like that from her. What? Yeah. You haven't told me that. That's wild. I told you that. Didn't I don't yeah, no. remember that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's happened on a couple of occasions. Okay. <laughs> does she does she respond to these messages? Like what She hasn't yet. No, my my wife is not as into this and so I think she's just kinda like, uh, whatever. <laughs> um but she was definitely the sort of what got me sort of started down the, the path. And, um, you know, I just kind of stayed in it. And I had a group of friends and we were all kind of into occultism and, and, you know, the magic with and psychis, psychicism and paranormal as kids. And we did things like we made a uh, we made homemade dowsing rods and made a, a ley line map of St. Augustine just by walking around the town and like following the dowsing rods. Um, cool. Cool. And, uh, you know, we had uh, experiences in the woods that were with odd creatures. And, you know, so it was just kind of a, a cool place to grow up and hard not to get into this stuff living where I did. So this lady, she was kind of like, sounds like she kind of like had like some, did she have some like folk magic practices or beliefs that she engaged in? Do you know? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, it was kind of interesting because it was kind of like, Folk magic, but also like new agey. <clears throat> Not in like the ult like the supremely woo way, but she was definitely into you know the psychic side of things. Um, she was a she was a psychic. She was a proud psychic, and she would like she wouldn't charge people for it. It's just like she was just like the local psychic who you went to if you wanted to ask a question of a psychic, and she would just give you the answer, and you know you could you could give her something in exchange if you wanted to, but that's not what she was interested in. So, um, but she also, um, man, she was so cool. So she collected dolls because she wanted to open a doll museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you would go into her house, into her sitting room, and the walls would be lined with like 50 dead-eyed dolls. <laughs> <laughs> Just like staring down at you. Um, and one of the experiences I had with her, which which was really interesting, was with one of these uh, dolls. It, 
uh, my friend and I went to go see her, and this was probably in college. Um, just visited. We visited her with her socially all the time. Um, and she would just, so she, you know, the, to get back to the folk magic, I think it was more of a, um, like something that came naturally to her, like kind of a, you know, psychic channeling, mediumship, that kind of thing. So we were sitting with her in this room full of dolls and she was telling us about how her mother had just passed and it had been like two weeks or so since her mom had passed and her mom must have been like 102 or something like that wow. um, and and she but she so we're sitting there and she had this fan on the floor and it was this fan that um i could only describe it by saying like it looked like something from like it looked like an old droid from the jawas uh, <laughs> workshop like on tatooine <laughs> it was just this weird little cylindrical green thing that made this sort of whooshing noise. Um, I, I don't know, like, where this, fa how old this fan was, but they they repaired small appliances, so they like everything they had was, you know, this weird and old. Um, so it was spinning at this certain rate, and we were talking about it, and then the conversation stopped, and the fan started spinning at a different rate of speed. It went, you know, it was going, and then it went, and then she stopped and looked around and said, "Oh, I think Mama's here to visit." Hmm. And so we were like, okay, what should we do? And then she goes, um, yep, yep, I do think that Mama's here. Hello, Mama, I'm just having a visit with these boys. And at that very moment, one of the dolls on the wall said, Mama! Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And she was like... She was like, oh, okay, thanks, Mama. I'm glad to have you. We'll, we'll talk later. We'll have another visit. <laughs> and as soon as she said goodbye, as soon as she said goodbye, the fan started, like, spinning at a normal rate again. Huh. Um, and then another thing about her is that she was also very, like, funny and, like, whimsical about the whole thing. She would play, like, pranks on her neighbors and stuff. Um, but she looked at us and she goes, you want to see something really weird? And she goes up to the doll that said Mama and takes it off the shelf and takes uh, the back of the doll off, and there's no batteries inside the doll. Oh, man. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it's, it's all, a whole creepy doll motif, but seriously, I mean, she sounds like she was pretty amazing. I mean, this oh, is... Absolutely. This is... Um, you know, we've talked a lot to a lot of people about, like, folk magic and kind of like... And a lot of those people are really, really in tune to... Uh, I guess the other world for lack of a better term, better term, but yeah, that's uh, sounds like she kind of was in a way like a kind of a shaman for the community, for the little community there. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that, you know, that, that probably, that, that kind of fits the bill. Um, yeah. She was just, you know, she's just very, very like, if you go to visit North Florida, um, that's, that's one of the kind of people who, who live there. Um, it's a really interesting place. North Florida is. So, well, Garrett, what about you? What kind of like personal experience do you, do you have? A personal experience that uh, profoundly affected you? Um, I mean, nothing like that, I don't think. But uh, I mean, most of my childhood, I spent being terrified of it. Um, my parents got those Time Life books. Yes, so they were all over the house. Mysteries of the unknown. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I don't know why they did that to me. And like communion and. My dad would talk to me about uh, chariot, chariots of the gods all the time and uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. all this kind of stuff, you know, which is problematic. But, you know, that that's kind of – it was around me all the time. My parents also did not put blinds on my windows in my bedroom. So uh, I just had these open windows, and I was just terrified of waking up and seeing, like, some gray aliens watching me sleep. So I was just – you know, yeah. just like, kind of a terrified about all this. And, I think I know. think that was pretty common for yeah. <laughs> for uh, kids in the West uh, back then. You know, yeah, I can like, I, I have similar so I had similar fears when I was really young. I mean, it was like some of my biggest fears were aliens and stuff like that. Just yeah. being terrorized by the yeah. media pretty much. Yeah. So, yeah. Same here. I mean, especially with okay, that good. creepy, <laughs> especially with that creepy ass book cover. I mean, that Man, the communion book cover scarred a generation of children. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I I love the uh, 
I love what they did with it in that X Files episode, Jose Chung from Outer Space. Yes. You guys ever seen that? Where they uh, they did the takeoff with the with the cigarette in its mouth. That was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess but, fear, but, you know, is pretty, is re- related to fascination. So then, uh, I guess you eventually overcame your fear and. and yeah, uh, yeah. So that was part of it. Like I, when I moved to Seattle, um, I was talking to Jeremy and tim about this kind of stuff and i read actually i read mothman prophecies and Mm -hmm. i read communion and then i felt actually felt better after reading those books Uh, even though you know it's scary it actually you know kind of changed my perspective about it um sure and not so it's not so like nuts and bolts these things coming from out of space it's more of this mysterious dreamlike unexplainable thing it, it helped me um but then shortly after that, I did have one experience that was kind of weird. Um, when I was in a house, I was living in this uh, vegan straight edge punk house with like 10 other people. And I was like cooking something on the stove. And uh, I felt out of the corner of my eye, something was looking at me. And I turned my head and I saw this thing looking at me um, just for like a second. And then it was gone. But it what was weird is is it, is it looked like me, um, like mm, looking okay. at myself, like a doppelganger. And, yeah, uh, and it was like, like confused, like huh, you know, that kind of face, like like it was looking at me. I was it was so weird. I freaked out. I ran upstairs. Um, yeah, and people in my house had been seeing things and hearing weird things, having nightmares, and. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know what that was exactly. And shortly after that, too, my friend Jake uh, found this letter that he brought to me um, that was in this suitcase. And it said, uh, um, thank you for believing in time travel. Please write back, uh, Jared. <laughs> and that kicked off this whole thing that like uh, we started We did, like 10 years later, we did a time travel party. It just like this whole like it became this whole thing. Um, after that this is weird random letter we found but um yeah that's that's, that's right you're to blame yeah I, I remember you talking yeah that's you were talking yeah. about that in you guys podcast with your time travel party yeah we kind of did this time travel party where we invited time travelers from all uh, you know all eras to come meet at once and uh i don't know i don't know if there were time tra- there were some weird people at this party but i don't know if, uh, if there are time travelers or not but it ended up being uh <laughs> You never know. <laughs> like a year to the date to the uh, election, you know. Uh-huh. I I started feel, and we the whole like theme was like the shitty Biff future. I don't know if I could say that, but um, yep. We had a picture of like uh, Biff Tannen from <laughs> who, from uh, Back to the Future, who's modeled yeah, after yeah. Donald Trump, and um, yeah, it was just like, oh god, did, did I just like fork the timeline with this silly party that we did? Yeah, so Probably, I'm to blame. Guys. Probably, I'm, I'm sorry. I yeah, apologize. It's all your fault, this is a conspiranormal <laughs> exclusive, guys. We have the guy that's to blame for this, for this dystopian yeah. nightmare that we now live. <laughs> it just means we have to have another party. I mean, I know. <laughs> yes, get some more time travelers. Well, since we're on the subject of time travelers, Jeremy, you actually have a time. Ta- well, I guess quote unquote time traveler story. Right. Yeah. Share. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Uh, and, let me... And this is uh, this is on the map. So. This is on the map. Yep. Um, you know, actually, I should mention too my my experience. Some of my, uh, my the where Willie Watkins lived is also I put that on the map down in Florida too. Yeah, I was reading that today actually. Yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of other stuff that I could add, but I'm trying to personally. I try to like keep my own experiences like a little more closer to my chest because I don't want to like represent this map as being open. Um, to you know anything and then sort of you know influence it in one, one direction or the other but there's definitely some stuff that that i have that i could put on so yeah so this was at a wendy's um in central florida and uh we were going to like this is this is like a family vacation kind of so you know i was like probably 11 or 12 and like wearing flip-flops and a big extra oversized t-shirt like you know just just gangly tween kid um, so yeah. Oh yeah. I guess it was closer when I was seven or eight. Now that I think about it. Um, 
So yeah, my family and I were eating at Wendy's. Um, I'm just going to read what I have here. While we were sitting at the table, a couple entered the restaurant dressed in 19th century, like Southern attire. Um, she was wearing a hoop skirt and bonnet, and he was in like a riding suit of some kind with a little top hat. Um, now this is a theme park area, so at first we wondered if they were actors of some kind. Oh, and I should mention, I didn't mention this in the map, but this was at breakfast. This was like 8 a.m. in the morning. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is a theme park area. So first we wondered if they were actors, but then we noticed that their clothes were dirty and sweaty, and they were their clothes were like patched and worn. They didn't look like they were like wearing Disney costumes or something like that. They looked like they had just been traveling for a long time, like riding on horseback or whatever. And then they looked really stunned. Like, they really looked surprised to be where they were. And they walked right past the dining room and the counter and walked directly to a water fountain. Okay. They stood at the water fountain and inspecting it. Like, I very clearly remember the guy, like, bending over and peering into, like, the little vents on the side of the water fountain. But they never pressed the button. They never took a drink or, figure, like, got water out of it. And then, like... Without a word, they just left. Like, they walked through another door, and we, like, looked out the window, and we're like, they, they're just gone. They totally vanished. So, that was that was the whole experience. That is bizarre. Yeah. yeah. That is really bizarre. You know, with stuff like that, I, and, and, you know, I've actually heard similar stories to that, and... <laughs> Not that I know if I'd really believe in time travel, but I would almost wonder if you could like go to the Hall of Records or like the archives and maybe see if anybody wrote some story like we were on our buggy, our horse and buggy, and then all of a sudden there was this <laughs> no, the, magical the place, yeah. Oasis, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. we were, called called Wendy's. <laughs> we, we didn't know where we were. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And there was this there was this strange contraption and there was this kid in weird attire staring at us the entire time. We smelled this was delicious food, but we did not partake of the food of the of the girl. Probably would have had to pay with like a silver dollar or something. You know? Eighteen thirty five. Well, that's interesting because that's what, what part of Florida was that? That was Central Florida, so the or Greater Orlando area. I mean, would it have been settled in the 19th century? Very, very sparsely, like okay. very sparsely. But it would have been like, um, you know, I mean, it would have been as much as I hate the word, it would have been plantation area, you know, like to the, to the best of my knowledge, uh, you know, it would have been all just all farms and. But yeah, so yeah, that is that is very 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 strange. And like I said, I've heard I've heard stories like that before. That is something that Jeremy and uh, I like to do is actually go look in the archi archives and old newspaper records and try to find things. And we found Jeremy especially has found really interesting stuff that way. Um, and like. He had access. You have access to like UW, uh, University of Washington materials and stuff, and well, yeah. we found really just wild things. In fact, just today, that that story that came in today, uh, there's a some uh, a, a woman who grew up in this house in Seattle, and and she had all these experiences there. And then a, a neighbor, after they moved out, told her that they had lived there and they'd had similar experiences. And so I'm really curious about going to do some research about that house if anything happened there and yeah it's just a really fun it's just you know just another layer of thing you can do on top of um you know these these points mm -hmm. yeah let's talk a little bit about like the, how you guys divide up this map uh the different categories and i mean i have it pulled up but uh kind of explain some of these different categories like how you guys uh, separate all this out I mean, you've got some basic stuff like ghosts and UFO encounters, but you've got some pretty interesting time travelers. And like, how do you guys separate all? Like, how do you separate the, into these different categories, and what you include in them? This is, um, I, I mean, we really. This is another one of those examples where, like, we just wrote stuff in 15 minutes that we thought was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do want to know what a lanyard zombie is. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's kind of just we we're making at the time like i told you we were making fun of uh this or this tolkien idea of you know and, and kind of hating on amazon so everyone all these people walk around with lanyards around their neck on their neck to like get into the amazon building so that's actually really just what we're talking about there yeah, they're, uh, so, so they're included with drones, corporate death zones, and cupcake shops. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really what this means is maybe that that's, yeah. But it's also like anything kind of just beyond scary, you know, like demons yeah. or something or that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And then, you know, I mean, time distortions, I think, is probably self-explanatory. Um but then I know that we also leave open the possibility that people can, we let people choose more than one category. So, you know, you might have like a classic UFO close encounter with missing time. And so you might put that as a classic UFO and a time distortion. And then if like you had some sort of horrifying fire in the sky experience, you might also include dark forces in that too. Um, but then we also have like mythologies because we want people to feel like – one of our like this is one of our biggest points that we always come back to and and is probably one of our um, favorite sort of touch points for what we're doing is the idea of remythologizing your landscape so that like one of the cool things about the paranormal and the occult and just um, interesting and amazing stuff in general is that you can go out into your landscape and start seeing it as a place of wonder again and start finding like, mythologies behind it um so we have this mythologies category for people to take advantage of if um you know like there was one person who thought he cited odin i think the all father <laughs> interesting okay <laughs> yeah yeah and uh but we you know and, and again we don't we don't debunk anything so we just want to we want to give people the opportunity to put that kind of thing there if they if they so, yes. desire. so what exactly is a pre-shamanic deer cult <laughs> uh, that's another podcast. I mean, that's a great band yeah. name, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's totally another uh, podcast entirely. <laughs> so if if this these different phenomena are interrelated, then I guess the idea of hotspots is even more important. So, like, instead of grouping it by the type of phenomenon, you guys are grouping it geographically. So, it, I guess the hope is that we're gonna we'll learn something more about how to think about this stuff in a different way. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I'm working on a new iteration of the map, too, and so, like, right now, there's, like, one point per, per story, but in the future, it'll be this point that has maybe multiple stories that people continue to have different experiences in the same place. Yeah. Um, because we've got a little bit, of like, oh, update, I went there and this happened, you know, so... Mm -hmm. um, I. So mapping that all out, I also wanted to say is that, and I, I, you can tell that we have a chip on our shoulder about Amazon, but, you know, Seattle, when we started this map, Seattle was going through this very rapid change uh, because of the growth mm -hmm. of Amazon and places were kind of disappearing. And I think that was another reason why we wanted to, like, you know, put us put like markers in the ground a little bit about like, these are kind of uh, special places um and kind of uh track them because it, it felt like things were disappearing and vanishing a yeah little bit. Mm -hmm. so well we can uh, totally relate here uh in nashville because the rapid development is just uh i mean like the the uh tallest point way back in the day was a uh, um this statue of hermes on top of union station and mm -hmm. uh i mean that's that's so i mean it was overshadowed you know decades ago but now it's like Hermes is just being surrounded by these gargantuan condos and developments and uh, buildings. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, I can totally relate to one to kind of preserve some of that stuff for, for the future. Yeah, most right. People don't even know it's there anymore. Yep. Yeah. But now people can go, you know, we, what we want is we want people to be able to go on this map and eventually what we really want. And this is kind of one of the reasons why we started our whole ambassadors program um, is to have so many sites and so many stories that if I wanted to go like visit y'all in Nashville, I could go, oh, cool, what's on the map that I could go see? Right. Almost like an Atlas Obscura for this kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, totally. So the categories I think are cool. Um, but another thing that I think is going to be neat when we do 
the updated site, which hopefully will happen sometime before, um, I don't know, the end of the year. I am <laughs> <laughs> um, like, like, like I mentioned, I'm into plants and, you know, botany and that kind of thing. I also, um, I do permaculture design. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that idea, the, the permaculture or anything like that. <clears throat> um, but it's this, this idea of landscape design where you consider the entire system of a landscape before you make any changes to it. So it's not just going in and deciding what plants are going to work best in any in one place. It's also about like how those plants are going to use the water that's generated. Like what plants are best for an area that has a bunch of shadows that doesn't get much light. Like what's the soil type? What's the where's the wind coming from? That kind of thing. Yeah. And so what I think is going to be cool is hopefully when we do this next map iteration, eventually we're going to get to the point where there's going to be other layers like average temperature or, you know, wind speed, wind direction, air pressure. Um, what's the geological makeup of a place? Like we want to have a layer that you can yeah. put up that's like all the cave systems in the country, like yeah. all the coal mines in the country, you know, just like. If you could look at layers like that and then map those with these experiences, that could yeah. be super, super interesting. Yeah, yeah find and all also, the different correlations and mm -hmm. relationships going on. I'm also trying to build like an API so that I could suck in data from other people's, you know, other sources. Yeah. Um, and just have all these different layers on it. Because I think that's what we need more data so you can kind of look at it and see if there's any kind of strange patterns or. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what that's what I'm hoping to build towards. Yeah, that'd be interesting. So especially something like caves and uh, magnetic anomalies, and there's just so many possibilities. Right. You have a very interesting mascot, um, <laughs> Shrimpy. I the, the, I heard you guys talk about this in you guys uh, podcast, but uh, this th this is a crazy story, and this is one I guess that. I guess it was one of the ones that kind of got you guys kind of started on this somewhat because uh, th I guess this happened way back in the forties. Like, right. This is, this is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I was living in Seattle and I just moved out to this small town across the Puget sound. It's called Bremerton. And Jeremy was like, we had just started a map and Jeremy started searching like monsters in Bremerton. And he found this, old old account it was from strange magazine uh, but this woman who had this encounter in like 1948 uh, um where she was she was in her apartment she went down into the basement to do some laundry and um she was putting it in the dryer and she suddenly felt like behind her that there was something looking at her and she said that the landlord had told her you know, there was like exposed dirt under a corner of the basement and the landlord had said that if you went you know into that darkness you would eventually get to the ocean okay. but she turned around and there was this uh like six foot tall creature there with antenna uh that had all these legs like opening and closing oh. uh and she she freaked out obviously <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ran upstairs, packed her bags, moved to Seattle, uh, didn't come back. And she said she went to the aquarium in Seattle and saw a shrimp and said that that looked like what she saw. So this giant shrimp in Bremerton, uh, and we've, we've named him Shrimpy. Uh, <laughs> I, we have multiple shrimp costumes. Um, yeah, I've, I've kind of become like the shrimp mascot here in Bremerton and got into the local paper trying to convince the town like, like this should be our mascot. Uh, <laughs> yeah like the city council uh, city council members and stuff talking to me about it like that they want to change it <laughs> it's amazing it kind of took a life of its own but um yeah i love how he's depicted uh carrying yeah. a sock <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he's the one who takes your 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 uh your missing sock of the laundry machine yeah <laughs> but i've done some research like okay was this a real person you know it, it was like a story that got submitted to this magazine right right and I, it's, I, it's one of the pulp magazines from the 40s so you don't really know it's like the amazing tales and like 
the deer like the the shaver mysteries it's all kind of dubious so right well actually i think the magazine came out in maybe the 80s or 90s but the okay. experience happened back in the 40s okay okay so i think it, it's not that it's not one of those very old old magazines but still you know i don't think they tried to uh investigate it that much they just published it but i did do some research i found one person named this and i found like her daughter who still lives in seattle but it's like 85 and i had to write i wrote her a letter in the mail like i tried to be as delicate as possible like did your mom ever see a giant shrimp (laughs) (laughs) a a man-sized shrimp (laughs) (laughs) yeah her son wrote to me on facebook though and was like i don't think it's my that's my grandma uh but so but she's really literally the only one I could find with that name. So I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I would love to talk to the person, the the daughter. Um, but, you know, the, yeah, I, I respect I them not that, wanting to talk about this and make it part of their family lore. Right. I, I could see how this would be like a... Um... Uh, uh, maybe like a, a something that someone would never really want to talk about ever again. Right. I mean, that, would probably, that would probably be kind of shocking. There was a, a story um, we had Jason Offit on, and I'm trying to remember what it was that he talked about. I could I could kind of remember that it was like something about like this woman that like in the 70s in California, and she had a she was at a hotel room, and she had a dock on the door. And there was, like, a guy at the door, but she had a suspicion that it was, like, she felt like it was a giant cockroach dressed as a man. Ooh. <laughs> and it was trying to talk her talk her into, like, uh, opening the door. And, like, she closed the door, she looks out the window, and she sees, like, this giant, like, cockroach is, like, scurrying away. Oh my gosh! I think that's what happened in this. So when, when you guys, when you told me that, st- when I heard that story on you guys' show, I was like, "That's very similar to the, because what is a shrimp but the cockroach of the sea, right?" I mean, right, right. Yeah. Well, it's that thing where like there's maybe this phenomena that's happening, but the only you you see it through like the lens of where you are and your your like your culture or whatever, like what. Right. Like we can't we can't figure out what it looks like or your your brain just kind of maps it to these things that you do understand. Yes. So it's interesting. I think it's, that's, that's interesting that they are having similar experiences around the same time or um, anyway. Like it, like it seems to be something that like you're, a lot of people talk about that for like Bigfoot sightings, especially to say that those, what you're actually seeing is some kind of entity and your mind puts this, you know, quasi human on it that you see but it's just like you you you, you, like there's another story that greg bishop tells um about a ufo encounter and this woman that had a ufo encounter and she comes back and there's like a man-sized rabbit standing (laughs) in her in her driveway Mm. so it's like you know why would it choose to show itself as like a giant cockroach or a giant shrimp like what <laughs> where is that and it's like it scans our minds and says oh giant shrimp that's what yeah it's like yeah. the stay puff stay puff marshmallow man it's like yeah uh, right. the form has been chosen or whatever right <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. you know what's funny is another one of those things that happened jeremy and i went out looking for this thing called the screaming well just like a um like an urban legend in Seattle and this kind of kind of no like forgotten area of town. Um, and we were like, look, looking through this old, this place called the black river riparian forest. And, uh, there was all these weird structures that someone had made out of wood. Um, this weird place. But when we came out, there's this man standing there next to a, a silver car and he had these goggles on mm-hmm. that had antennas on them. And immediately, like, I started getting, like, hair standing up on my arms. Mm-hmm. And it felt, like, a little bit like Doc Brown, uh, you know, time travel, uh, like a DeLorean kind of. And he, he pulled up his goggles and was like, hey, guys, want to fly? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> we're just like, what? 
<laughs> he opened his trunk and he had all these extra pairs of goggles and he put them on us. And we had and our kids. We had our kids. We had our kids. With yeah, we had our kids with us, and so they put them on too. And basically, what he had is these drones that would, he could fly around, and you, he held, we had to hold on to his car because we could see through the drone as it flew around using these goggles. So, like it was flying all around, it came flew up to us, and we could see ourselves. Um, and it was he was like zipping through the trees. It was really really weird. Anyways, we went home and we were talking to Tim about it, and he's like, guys. Uh, you totally just encountered like a modern manifestation of like you know a fairy or so, like hanging out at the edge of the forest and right. like giving you the gift of flight and and let, letting you look at your body from outside yourself. Um, and then I looked at a picture I took of him and he had TikTok like the white rabbit like uh, tattooed on his knuckles. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, wait a second. Like, this is like a mod. He's like a stoner drone guy. Like, that's like the modern manifestation of this kind of entity. Yeah, Anyways, it was just a crossroads. Don't forget, he was standing was, at the cro crossroads. Right. right. Anyways, I mean, I don't fully believe that, but it's just like a fun idea to like consider and think about. And, make, and it was like a fun personal mythology almost. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you're not yeah. just you're not discounting to say that like well it wasn't a real person, but kind of like that's the kind of the experience that you get that you had. Right. There's um a story that uh, our good friend Doctor Future, who's been on the show many times, he talks about going to Area 51, and he just went to like to the perimeter of Area 51, and he was driving, and there was a car parked off to the side. And there was just this guy, like in like full wizard robe with a big long beard <laughs> with a staff, <laughs> just like standing there next to this car, just kind of looking, lo looking straight ahead. Well, Mike stops. He goes. <laughs> he 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 goes and looks looks at the at the fence real quick, and then he comes back. And it's probably five minutes later, and the guy's just gone. Yeah. So it's like, was that a real person? What, why would there be somebody like you know? I, you know, maybe they come up from Sedona for the weekend or something. But, but it's just like, it, yeah. So, you, you, in, in that respect, like you just kind of don't know. I mean, it could have been a real person. Maybe right. they just were like, "Hey, let me just freak these people out." But then, you never know, dude. You never yeah, know what I, it could be. I love I love love stuff just on the edge like that. You know, and it, it's just a fun way to. Uh, participate in the world, I guess. Right. Well, and to me too, like what it, it you know, a real person or not, um, you, it could be both. Like it could be both. You know, if you if you're out and if you're like um, an ancient Roman augur and you're looking at the way the birds are flying, um, it doesn't mean they're not real birds. I mean, you're getting you're getting some sort of message, right? I mean, that's true. Like that that person was there, like that drone guy was there at the right time for us like we were the people that would probably most appreciate him being there you know taking us from that flight so it's almost it was like a serendipitous moment no matter what yeah right so, so there, what stories stand out for you guys some of your favorites what, what a couple of maybe your favorite stories from the map um, you know, the thing is, is that we have so many stories now. There are like old favorites that we've talked about on a bunch of, in a bunch of places already. Um, but then there's also, we got some really good new ones very recently. Did any of those stand out for you, Garrett? The, uh, the rainbow guy, the, yeah, yeah. The rainbow guy is really cool. Yeah, that was it. That's the one I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, that was interesting. Luminescent rainbow stick man. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Also in, in Florida, I believe. <laughs> of course, of course. So, um, I can read it, guys, if you want. Yeah, yeah, there, you want to find Because uh, I, I got it pulled up. So he says, uh, this was in, yeah, I guess Central Florida as well. Um, so this, this happened when I was maybe 11 or so. I was walking to my friend's house in the neighborhood. 
This particular friend lived a bit farther away than others, and I was kind of just zoned out on a particular stretch of road that used to be a coquina dirt road between two sets of paved roads. Something caught my eye on the other side of the road. I looked over up and saw what I can only describe as a bright rainbow pixelated stick man. If you think how you would have animated a walking stick man on Atari graphics of the 80s, you'd have nailed it. (laughs) Only it was literally every color of the rainbow. Like most of us, I suppose, we've had all our encounters, with, had our encounters with weirdness. I wasn't necessarily afraid, but I was curious. I remember kind of reaching out to it mentally with a "Hey, what's up?" and got the strong impression it saw me. It was not the least bit interested in me. At that moment, I had a car, heard a car approaching. As this entity was in the middle of the oncoming lane, I thought, "Okay, this is about to be interesting." However, when I looked away from the car and back at the rainbow stick man, it was gone. Florida is a beautiful magic place, but I still have no idea what happened that day. Interesting, yeah. interesting yeah, story, cool. guys. I just think it's yeah, what it just doesn't fit anything else, you know. It's just so unique. Mm-hmm. Where do you even come down with on that? I, the, the closest thing I can think of, you know, in like the lore, would be like what are they? The Santa Fe? Is it the Santa Fe Walkers or? The, 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 Talk the, about those like those weird stick figure things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ghost walkers, right? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about, Garrett? I, th- I think I think you've sent me scary pictures of them, maybe. Oh, yeah, those walking stick men. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Those. I'm, I'm terrified of caught, googling it, honestly. Somebody caught those on film. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Those are really truly strange. Yeah, it was a good one from our. Oh, the Fresno. It was Fresno. Fresno. That's what. Yeah, yeah. The Fresno Nightcrawlers. Yeah, that's the only thing I could think of where I'm like, hmm, like, because that's the way my brain works. Like, what have I heard? What have I, you know, where have I seen something similar to this before? Um, when I get these reports in, and it's it's always so cool because, like, as Garrett said, you know, I studied this for a long time, and so I have a lot of this stuff in my brain, and it's so cool getting a story like this one where it's like. This is unlike almost anything I've ever come across. <laughs> right. The other one that I like, like the, in that regard, is um, there's that flip top head guy from Australia. You remember that one, Garrett? Mm. This is um. So this was a mm. uh, here. I, I can read it real quick. So it was 2013. Um, driving down Port Road with my then partner, we saw a guy in a roofless sports car. There was a female passenger. <laughs> I noticed that when he accelerated, his head would flip right back as though he was a Pez dispenser. <laughs> when he slumped down, his head rolled forward, facing down towards his feet. Either way, he couldn't have possibly seen where he was going, but this continued for at least five minutes. <laughs> I looked at my partner. She also witnessed this. Eventually, Pez dispenser man, or flip-top head, as we came to call him, turned off the road, his head facing downward as he entered a driveway to his left. <laughs> What? <laughs> yeah. High strangeness. Absolutely. Yeah, but some of the some of the ones uh, there's our favorites. You know, some of our favorites are like the uh, sandwich from hell. Or yes. if someone's if someone's gonna go look on the map, I, I'd say like the sandwich from hell or the root beer incident one. I'm not sure if it has a different name. Okay, you so what's search. what's the sandwich from hell one? <laughs> um, uh, you, you guys can't just you know you got okay. you got you got to talk about that. Uh, All right, yeah. sandwich from hell. This uh, person got up on. They're waiting for a bus, kind of a rural area in Seattle or North Seattle, and there was no one around, like an empty bus stop. Bus pulled in, and they got on the bus, and they were the only one on. And they went all the way to the back. I think it was one of those buses that has two connected buses. I don't know if you ever seen those. Like a, they have like an accordion part in the middle. So yeah, all the way to yeah. the back. And then, out of the blue, three other people got on the bus. And she was like, uh, there was no one else around. What's that all about? And so those three people came, and they came all the way to the back of the bus with her and sat down n- near her. She's like, okay. And this is late at night, and the bus took off. And then they, uh, they started rubbing their hands together and saying – are you ready? Are you ready? And she was like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Freaking out, obviously. But then, like, one of them pulled out, like, a giant 12-foot – it's not 12-foot. A foot-long sandwich. 
Put one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like started unwrapping it. She's like, oh, okay. They're just going to eat a sandwich. They're stoked about it. They're not going to rob me or something or do whatever they were going to do. So they started unwrapping the sandwich and they opened the bread up. And inside of the bread, in between the meat and the cheese, were these little moist towelettes, like little wet naps. No. And they pulled out the wet naps, and they took the sandwich, and they just threw the sandwich on the ground and kicked it away. And they gave each other the wet naps, and they unwrapped them, and they just started cleaning their jackets with the towelettes. And that's it. That's the end of the story. What the (laughs) hell? what, What was that? What was going on? Just like this bizarre, almost like Twin Peaks. Like, am I having a nightmare? Yeah. Absurd. Experience. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Garrett, I, I think you mentioned uh, Mothman prophecies earlier. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. And a big part of that, I think you know where I'm going with this, that Kiel talks about in that book, is these weird men in black encounters. Right. Where they would actually go into people's homes and they would they wouldn't know what a fork was. Um, they would look at some like you know normal everyday household utensil and be like, hmm, "What's this?" Or they would eat something that was just bizarre. I remember like someone just wanted salt and they were just eating yeah, like a yeah. pile of salt in their hand, just like eating it. Right. That one always like freaked me out. And they were like just like really robotic motions. Right. And. Uh, you know, there's that similarity also to stuff like the Black Eyed Kids and the way in those stories. You know how you hear about how they ask for these really bizarre things, like to come in the house and read. And uh, there's the David Jacobs stuff about his hubrid stuff that, um, where you know his whole speculation is that it's alien human hybrids that are being trained to replace us and all this kind of stuff. Right, but uh-huh. that that but you know Nick Redford pointed out that that's very similar to the Black Eyed Kids and just but so you get all these kind of like weird strange behaviors in these like almost like they're they're enacting some kind of weird OCD like ritual. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's just weird people, which is definitely possible. But it's like you know st- stuff like that is almost like it's almost like a play acting mechanism there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, and then that actually it almost almost reminds me a little bit too of the Wendy's encounter we were talking about. Sure. Right. You yeah. know. And then of course, you know, the uh UFO stories about like, you know, the infamous space pancakes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But... Which I still want to find the I still want to figure out the I want to make the space pancakes somehow. <laughs> <laughs> When we, when we start our like liminal head, Earth headquarters, we should make space. Pa- we have a menu and make space pancakes. I think that would be really good. Yeah. Well, I don't think they'll taste that great because <laughs> they were just like buckwheat flour and like I don't know ashes or something. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, 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 just think about like the fact that the Air Force had to actually like go and analyze pancakes scientifically. <laughs> scientifically analyze pancakes. I love it. Pancakes from <laughs> pancakes from space. Yeah, that, that's a that's 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 such a weird story. It's such a wonderfully weird story, and it's like that's that was the inter, just think about it. That was the interaction that that guy had with those beings was they came down, and they and they were just making pancakes on a griddle, and they gave him some, and then they left. Yeah, <laughs> like what? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it, it, it's it's always that kind of like that 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 high strangeness. It's almost just like there's a warp in, I guess, consciousness when you're dealing with those type of things. And it's almost like the mund- mundanity of that of those actions, maybe in a certain way, can it can cause some kind of hypnotic effect on someone. Oh, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. I've, I've thought about I've thought about that too. Like, what exactly is the mechanism that is taking place there? So that, that you know what that makes me think of is um, like the sounds people hear sometimes. Mm-hmm. The strange sounds that that happen. Like we actually um, in this last batch of entries, we got two separate entries, both of which um, the encounter included, like eerie unearthly drumming that sounded like 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 one person describes it as like native american drumming 
Um, but one of the sightings was a UFO sighting, and the other one was the sighting of an enormous, like, gray wolf. And they were yeah. totally apart from each other. But they both happened to be encountering, uh, you know, encountered with this, like, um, this guy says, like, it sounded like the few times I've been to a powwow, but without singing. Mm-hmm. This drumming. Is that the mystery wolf? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, encounter yeah okay, so i can i can read if you want i'll read that real quick yeah um i was walking my dog alone in the woods i first saw this is 2005 i first saw shadows out of the corner of my eye when i looked up i saw a huge white gray wolf raising his head to look at me about 25 meters away the first thing i thought was how beautiful it was then i was terrified it would go after my dog and i knew it wasn't alone I backed away slowly and took a shortcut out of the woods to walk the tree line back to my house. My dog hadn't noticed a thing, not unusual for him. Suddenly I heard a drum beat. It was out of place enough that I stopped to listen and figure out what it was and where it was coming from. My neighbor's house was empty and dark and there were no other houses in the area. It sounded like it was coming from the woods and it sounded exactly like the few times I've been to a powwow but without singing. I tried to brush it off and took one step forward. The drum stopped. I took one step backwards. The drum started again. I panicked and chased my frantic dog all the way home. So, um, you know, with that in mind, having just read that, now listen, listen to this one. This okay. is a this is UFO with drumming. It came from the same bath. So this is this is from September 2019. It says while camping in the Saint, uh, San Luis Valley near San Acacio, Colorado, on a friend's private land this summer. Um, I had a strange experience. The event took place on September 7th. While myself and two friends were camping, it was around 15 minutes before 7, so there was still plenty of sunlight remaining. One friend was sleeping in the tent as he was recovering from a long night of work the night before. His brother and I were attempting to get a fire started, but were having a little trouble because there were very strong winds. Suddenly, I heard a very rhythmic drumming sound coming from the opposite side of a hill we were camping on. This area is extremely isolated with no homes for as far as the eye can see. The only way I can accurately describe the sound is a steady drumming that reminded me of the Native American drums that I've heard during ritual recreations at festivals. The sound was a single drum, though. It went on for about 10 minutes with both of myself and my friend hearing it. We were mystified. It was so strange that I was questioning as to whether or not I was really hearing it. I believe the sound was confirmed to me after around five minutes as coyotes began to howl in the same direction the drumming was coming from. Uh, I wanted so badly to walk the 1,500 feet or so to the hill to climb to the top and see if anything was on the other side. The only thing that stopped my walk to that hill was the amount of extremely thick-quilled cactus needles between myself and the hill. After 12 minutes or so of the drumming, I was staring in the direction the sound was coming from, and in the sky I saw something that I can't explain. It was what appeared to be a hovering sphere roughly three times larger than any star I've ever seen. It was in the distance but not extremely far away. I saw the sphere in the southern sky, and it was extremely illuminated. It never moved or twinkled. It just hovered about 45 to 55 degrees above the horizon. I yelled out for my friend to look, and he saw it as well. We watched it together for just over a minute. Suddenly, I yelled out that I was going to take a video with my phone. As I said that, he looked away, too, to grab a set of binoculars I brought on the trip. As I opened the camera app on my phone, I pulled the phone up to the sky to locate the light in the viewfinder, and it was gone. I pulled the phone down to look at the sky, and sure enough, it was nowhere to be seen. I asked my friend if he was able to get a look through the binoculars. He said that once he looked away to get the binoculars and pulled them up to his eyes, he couldn't locate the object. It was gone. The drumming uh, continued for another five minutes or so and then disappeared as well. Hmm. So that's kind of weird to me that, like, within the same, (laughs) you know, less than 24-hour period, we got these two accounts. One involves a UFO, one involves some kind of mysterious animal. Yeah. But the, but the experience is essentially the same. But the, but the UFO encounter, um, you know, he mentions the coyotes, which is a detail that I just noticed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's one, too. I, I, I noticed um, that there was a couple of stories that had to do with people seeing very law- unusually sized deer. As well, yeah. Um, so that to me is like an almost, and, and I'm sure, like I haven't seen any, but I'm sure there's there, there's probably some owl stories in there somewhere. So, but it seems to me that there's a very much like a screen memory type of aspect to this. Yeah, are almost like some kind of um, I me mean, going into that kind of altered state 
and seeing these weird animals and you know, there's there's something to all that. Right. Yeah. Or they have a special relationship uh, with the animals, or the animals have some kind of um, have have something to do with us entering these other states, you know, because you have, yeah. of course, all these animal motifs from the beginning of history. Maybe there's some kind of weird interplay. Yeah. I, I was actually, uh, I just remember this. I was on uh, my wife's like childhood home. They, she grew up in the woods and uh, South Georgia, kind of like on a commune almost with all these weird hippie families. And we were there visiting and this old man that was there told me about uh, how he once saw a UFO fly over that area. And after he saw it, a white dog came out of the forest. Mm. And it, it mm. stayed with them for a, a couple of years, so like a stray dog that they just would feed. And a couple of years later, they saw a UFO again, and the dog, white dog, started barking and ran out into the forest, and they never saw it again. Um, wow. Yeah, I have it recorded. And he has these, he's like an older guy, and he has like these giant blue blocker sunglasses on, and he, it's like a really wild story as he tells it. Um, yeah, but it was really weird. It just m made me think of this, like this dog, <laughs> like dog uh, UFO relationship. Yeah, and you know, back to you know, just free, uh, free associating connections too. Um, it brings me back to the original um, Skinwalker Ranch reports. Sure. About you know the giant weird wolf that would just like walk up and like grab a cow in its mouth and just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> the one that they kept shooting and and yeah. couldn't couldn't it, uh, get it to to die. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, whatever you think about Skinwalker, Skinwalker Ranch and the current state of, of that whole situation, it's still, I think yeah. it's one of the coolest, like, originally, like, with the first time I read the actual story, um, it was just like, oh, man, this is so cool. It's got everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys consider yourselves uh, paranormal cartographers. I wanted to know what you think about weird stuff around cartography and the history of map making and surveying and this kind of stuff, because of course there's you know esoteric and even occult elements to that whole process. I know you said you were uh, you all had dealt with like ley lines and stuff like that um, yeah, when yeah, you were no. younger, but yeah, I think there's. I mean, I think there's definitely something to the idea of. You know, I, I like I'm a I'm a dowser. Like I use dowsing rods when I go out and do stuff. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I absolutely 100% think that there's something to the idea of lines of energy. Um, you know, I think it's it can be kind of tricky because I think it's also like especially when you're dealing with like huge distances, it's mm -hmm. very easy to like draw a line between two points that are really far away. <laughs> right. You know. Um, I think of the map as like, um, I think for me, it's almost, um, you know, saying I'm a like a, a luminal cartographer is more of a metaphor for the idea of what we are encountering when we experience this kind of stuff is in mm -hmm. some sense map making. Yeah, and you're re-enchanting the world, like you you say, yeah, which has yeah. has to do with you know. The, I feel like in the UK, you know, they have the Earth Mysteries movement that was that really impacted the popular culture, and those ideas really influenced us here also. But I almost think that we're kind of having this moment now where the popularization of like synchronicity and and some of these different corners of Fortiana, where we're almost having this moment now of of all these different people coming together and kind of exploring this uh, weird America, you know that that's kind of like our own Earth Mysteries movement. Yeah, and it's almost like what Garrett was saying too about like you know we, you know I I know I like even if it was Tolkien or or. Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, fantasy novels or, like, the maps in the book were always one of the coolest parts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, like, the yeah book and totally. Be like, that is so cool. Like, I want to know, like, and so, you know, what, one of the things I think Garrett was getting at before, too, is, like, you know, without sounding, like, too cheesy, but, like, what if, what if the real map is inside us the whole time, you know, like? <laughs> <laughs> right. 
what if it's the movements that we're making as we explore this this thing that are collectively creating, you know, the map to the fantasy world? I know a lot of it is just like, you know, a lot of it's based with Seattle because you guys are there and that was the beginning of your project. But are there any areas that you see like there's a cluster of weirdness that stands out to you more than others? I don't I just don't think we have enough data yet to make those kinds of conclusions. Um, I mean, because it. Yeah, we just have like we have like we could say we say this sometimes. If you look in Brazil, there's a lot of UFO sightings there, but it's also because we got put on mm -hmm. a, uh, a UFO podcast or something down there. Right. So you, can, you know, it's not really because there's more of that there. It's because of the you know there was this like this certain audience that got hit with it. So if we just have more and more, the more data we have, then we can start making some conclusions or like maybe seeing uh trends but I, th I think the key is to get people to submit and also like um you know take ownership of their town and their area and to that's another reason why i think it's fun is to like discover things about your own town and that's why we're doing the ambassador program is so that there's someone in, in different regions kind of like trying to find things and uh, be like a curator almost uh, and like helping to uncover new things in the, all these areas all over the world is like the dream um, <clears throat> so that we can't, you know, because those are the people who are going to be the most invested in it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but it's hard to say that there's any, tr we can tell any, oh, it's really weird here. I don't, I don't think we can say that yet. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of talk about like something like the the 37th degree parallel, mm -hmm. and like the 33rd degree parallel is another weird one, and you know something that we're in that range. I'm just wondering as you get more information uh, coming from people's personal experiences, which is what this all is, whether mm -hmm. or not there's a way to kind of cooperate some of that evidence that other researchers have have looked at. Well, I think one thing that would be useful, um, particularly for uh, the you know the the purpose of gathering more data, is like it would be really cool to have people submit stuff. Like a lot of the entries that that we get that are like, wow, this is really interesting, are people who obviously um, you know might have thought about this a lot or um, written it out before, and you know, I mean, we have some like cool professional, you know, horror story, ghost story entries on there that's like five paragraphs long. And that stuff is amazing. But I would love to see more stuff like um, yesterday I was walking downtown and I saw a dog wearing human shoes. <laughs> that's, like, that's the whole entry, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, just, just whatever that's amazing or interesting or... Um, you know, awe-inspiring or striking that that happens to you, even if it seems like it's like not a big deal, or if it just seems like like just a blip. Um, I still think that like that is one of the cooler things to get. That's the kind <laughs> of thing that would be neat to see. I, I think Jeremy and I, you, we've talked about this. Like we go to some like paranormal conventions and table and stuff, and we get lots of stories that way. But it's people who are like seeped in the culture or whatever. And we were talking about how it would be really fun just to go to the mall or somewhere like not that and just get kind of everyday layman stories in this vein. Because like so many people, you know, when, I, when, we, when I first started doing this stuff with Jeremy online in early blogging days, a lot of the time I was working in a grocery store and just bagging groceries and like asking the customers, have you ever had a paranormal experience? And I got so many weird stories that way. Um, you know, I got some people looking at me real weird too, but uh, <laughs> we, we, it was cool. Like, just everyday people have, yeah. this, you know, very bizarre you may, things. Yeah. You may not want someone who's like too primed by other people's experiences already, like someone who might be at a convention. Right. I mean, that's not invalid, but it would be cool to get, you know, a, yeah. a broader, uh, yeah, data set, I guess. Right. And I think, like, the the sort of, like, 
whimsical approach. Like when we go to table at events, um, Garrett wears a shrimpy costume. <laughs> I, any know. excuse to really any excuse that's true actually Carol works a, a shrimpy costume to like you want to talk like social distancing <laughs> <laughs> people run far away yeah. So, but yeah but no wear the shrimpy costume and it's cool because all of a sudden this thing that like people are like think is like we're like we say like yes it is weird but that's okay and so like there, we so we did one event we did this um something called the short run festival here in seattle and it's not a paranormal event it's an event that is um it's dedicated to like zines and independent comics um and we were just like lucky to be invited to this event because the organizers thought what we were doing was cool so we went um Oh, and, you know, we do have zines for sale, so there's there was that, too. But we went there, and we tabled, and, like, all these people would come up to us because they were like, who's this dude? Why is this dude dressed like a shrimp? <laughs> and then we would tell them what we were doing and ask if anything had happened to them. And, like, nine out of ten people would say, oh, nothing like that ever happened to me, except this one time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? There's always an accept this one time, and that's the kind of thing that I think is missing from a lot of like the the discourse. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's a very common thing. That's what you hear all the time is the people that say that say that um, I didn't have any weird experiences ever, but you know, and then they'll tell you the weirdest thing you've ever heard, just like you said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very strange. Our our old uh, co-host producer Rob was like that. He um. He he told me he said, "Well, I've never really had anything weird happen to me, except for this one time where I carried on an hour long conversation with who I thought was my brother, but ended up not being." <laughs> 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 and it's probably one of the most amazing stories that you that uh, that you've ever heard. I want to read a couple here, and these are actually from. Uh, from our local area from Tennessee and uh, a couple that I thought were really that were that stood out to me because of course you know I'm, I'm going to focus on our our area so this is um, I think very close to uh, this I think is very close to Nashville I believe yeah Smyrna area which is kind of still middle Tennessee this is a deer encounter Wife and I was finishing our routine walk in the park and a long edge of the trail approximately 25 feet away from where we stood was a deer that was larger than any deer I have ever seen. I thought it was unusual because it was a white-tailed deer whose head was about seven feet tall, taller than any horse I have seen. It was very calm and did not seem to mind our presence, but I felt fearful and clapped my hands to shoo it away. I researched out of curiosity and found out that white-tailed deer are a lot shorter than seven feet. Park rangers thought it might have been a genetic mutation. I've also seen UFOs in that park, and there is a legend that a ghost child also haunts that park and can sometimes be heard crying. I will forget. It. I will never forget it either of my sighting. Yeah. So here's somebody that's had, uh, you know, at least two different types of sighting. Before he had seen a UFO in the park, and then later he saw this unusually tall deer, and that's pretty close to our. Uh, that's pretty. That's very close to our area here. Hmm. Um, another one that this one's just kind of weird. Which I love these. These are the more the kind of like the Fortiana ones that you uh, that you would denote with a with a frog. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess reminiscent of the uh, reminiscent of the f frog stories. Um, found a bagged lettuce near a pastor. <laughs> pasture. I'm not familiar with this brand of lettuce. When I picked it up, it was still cold, as though thrown from the nearby road. But why? No trucks pass this way. It's December, not barbecue season, and this is a very small town. The horses were nowhere near the fence, and the bag was still taped closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that that was actually during like a flap of weird like lettuce uh, sightings, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> I think like you saw like a a strange salad like yeah, on the yeah. ledge I, or something. I don't know if I ever got that on there, but yeah, I saw like a strange salad that was like sitting on top of a pillar. <laughs> uh, one of our one of our, our ambassadors like had a 
think it was broccoli. Like she found that it was broccoli outside of some site, like mysteriously appeared. Right. Right. But we could do a whole like when we get back to doing the podcast, um, we we definitely have talked about doing a whole episode about like mystery mysterious like food stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that one, the sandwich from hell, and the weird like there's some weird um like a weird hot dog museum in Philadelphia, like a like a, a abandoned pop up hot dog museum. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that's there's the- another one like I think someone they went to their garden and there's like these two perfectly placed sar- um, saltine crackers mm-hmm. like left um, almost like as an offering or something. I can't remember the details. There's another one, something about like that had something to do with the vegetable garden. And he, he, yeah. I remember he wrote to us on Twitter and asked us what entity uh, uh, uses this brand of saltines. <laughs> <laughs> but it reminds That's me a- of the pancake thing or something. The, the alien pancake thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's a there's a story that Steve Stockton says, which uh, he's he would be a cool guy to speak to. He's actually in down in Portland, so he's not too far from you. But he uh, he's from this area, East Tennessee, and he he talked about this story that somebody told him where they were just walking through the woods, and they look up, and there's just a surfboard in a tree. Oh yeah, just a random I surfboard. That, yeah. No, no idea how it got there. Why? You know, there's no. Pl- it's not exactly flyover country. So, you know, just real interesting stuff, guys. <laughs> I don't know if this is uh, on somewhat maybe a tangent, but do you do you know about that that rando nodding app? Yes. Yeah. yeah I. I uh, Surfiel may be a little more familiar with it. I know that uh, Strange Familiars, um, good friend Timothy Renner, they I think they've been using it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually, uh, I don't know if you heard that that kind of s- spooky story that happened in West Seattle where Jeremy lives. Some kids were using it on on the beach, and they got taken yeah. to this beach, and they found like a suitcase in the spot, and then it had a dead body in it. Oh too. yeah, I did hear about that. Yeah, that yeah. in pieces. Yeah, it was in pieces. Yeah, but um, it, I, I remember one of the early stories I read from that is that when pe- someone went out to the woods, they found like a African drum or something in the trees too, just hanging mysteriously. Yeah. It made me think of that. But uh, hmm. th- yeah, I think it, th- th- what they're doing seems a little bit similar. I could see some parallels, you know, just kind of going out into the world and you know, accepting that there's mystery out there and, and kind of looking for it. It's map based too. Yeah. Well, it's just really cool. This whole, uh, idea of really encouraging, um, this magical play into your life. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it's a fun way to live. Well, guys, thank you so much. This has been excellent. Um, Tell us, Gus, how to find Liminal Earth, how to find you guys, um, what's kind of like is next for y'all. Yeah, so um, we're our, our main website is liminal.earth. Um, it's just, just liminal.earth. Um, if you want to submit, you can submit stories right there from the homepage. There's something that says submit your story. You could also just go to liminal.earth slash submit. Um, the Probably the best way to get in touch with us or to find us re- regularly is on Twitter at Liminal Earth. Um, we're, we're pretty active there. Uh, we tweet a lot of stuff. Um, but we also you could find us on Facebook, and we have a very um, we're not we're not very good at Instagram, <laughs> but we're on- <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, um, we also have a Patreon. Um, you know, Patreon.com/slash Liminal Maps. And uh, gosh, that's it's pretty much what uh, the, the places where you can find us. Um, as far as next steps, Garrett, do you want to talk about the the map? Yep. Yeah, I think that, like I said, the next thing we're really working on is this update to the map. So it's uh, it's easier on us to publish things because right now we have to do a lot of Jeremy mostly just has to do a lot of manual work. Um, to kind of scrub things and get it get it on a map, but <clears throat> I'm I'm rebuilding it from scratch so that we can just control it all and also allow for other sources to come in 
uh, and and new layers to the map it'll make it a little bit it looks nicer and i think it'll be really good um yeah i think yeah and if people want to help us with that i mean there's it's it's, it's a you know and also like the ambassadorship program if you want to kind of take ownership of your town and we're very relaxed about it um yeah it's not it's not like having a second job or something. It's mostly just like chatting with cool people on a Discord and um, getting your uh, friends and people who you know to submit their stories for your area. So yeah, Jeremy gives you a funny title. It's just kind of like fun thing, you know, because we can't. It's easier for you to go maybe in your your uh, neighborhood Facebook group and like ask people like, hey, has anyone seen anything weird? Than for yeah. us to join every one of those groups and ask, and uh, yeah, and it's just it's just fun, chill people hanging out and talking about this weird stuff all the time. So, mm-hmm. cool. Well, excellent, guys. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Stay on the line for us. We're going to close this section out, but guys, we will be back to uh, close out the show on Conspiracy yeah. Normal. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Having. Thank you, guys. All right, welcome back, guys, to the show. Uh, we're just going to finish up here. That was a really good, interesting interview with uh, Garrett Kelly and Jeremy Puma from Liminal Earth. Um, pretty impressed with those guys. We, we covered a, a lot of good ground, and they were really fun to talk to. Yeah, and you guys should really go out. If you have experiences, you should really go and uh, create an entry on there and add yeah. to this database. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really valuable to what they're doing. I mean, and they've got a ton of entries from several different countries. And, you know, mm-hmm. reach out if you're interested, become an ambassador too. So um, I was looking at it a lot today, just kind of like doing research for the show. And it's it's really fun. It's really fun yeah. to explore it and, and see what uh, the different kinds of experiences people have. And they have different filters where you can just look at one of the categories or you know two or three of the categories instead of a, a lot so and then they another thing that they've got on there too it's kind of neat is uh they've got the different like triangles mapped out so they've got like the bermuda triangle and like a couple of others that are around the world which i thought was pretty interesting um so check please guys go and check these guys out support them they're doing really great stuff so uh we will just close out guys by saying that strange realities 2020 online is still happening all the all the uh the list of speakers is now on the website you can guys go to strangerealitiesconference.com tickets are twenty dollars and that's going to be september 25th 26th and 27th of this year and also right now for our patreons available we've got every including the q a session every single presentation from last year's conference you guys can go in there for one dollar and watch all of those so take advantage of that while you still can and and surfiel can tell you where to go for patreon go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal or if you don't want to have a reoccurring subscription fee you can just go to conspiranormal.com leave a one-time donation we also uh, really uh, appreciate uh, reviews on especially on itunes yeah absolutely absolutely all right guys um thank you so much and uh we're gonna be back with some more weirdness next time on conspiranormal channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.